Hello everyone and welcome to this course on modern application development. So the third service provider that I want to just mention about over here, which is on a totally different scale than what Replit for example does, is Google App Engine, right? And Google App Engine as opposed to Google Compute Engine is also a platform provider, right? So unlike Google Compute Engine where you can pretty much just create a virtual machine and then you're on your own, you install everything there after that. In App Engine, you actually can get started with, you know, assuming that there is a certain version of Python, the web server front end is taken care of for you, various other things are sort of automatically handled for you, okay? Which means that you can now focus on your code, right? So how exactly does App Engine work? You can sign up for an App Engine account, right? Basically a Google uh, Cloud account, right? So the URL, that you might notice on the top in the URL bar is basically console.cloud.google.com, right? So cloud.google.com is essentially how you get access to the Google Cloud. The console over there is essentially this thing which shows you a sort of, you know, a summary of everything that is available on Google Cloud for your particular project, right? So you can see that up here on the top, there is something which says Flask test, which is, I've just created a sort of dummy uh, app right, a project to demonstrate how you can create an app out here, right. It tells me a little bit of information about the project. It says what kind of resources it's using. It also shows me what are the number of requests per second that have been received, right. In this case, it's basically zero because I had just tried accessing it once a little while back and you know, that's about it. There are no more requests recently. It shows you the overall platform status, right. So that's the good thing. It's telling you that services are normal. What are the services that includes the web front end? the HTTPS, the secure services, the monitoring, logging, right? Uh, any databases, I'm not using a database, but if there was any database connectivity, what is the status of those? All that is what is considered as part of the cloud platform, okay? Of course, it also shows what are the estimated billing charges because this is on a paid basis, right? Uh, having said that, I believe that the basic app engine, at least like a very simple thing, if you try creating, it falls under the free tier. There are some things that you can use in order to experiment at least, okay? And if you sign up newly, then you actually get some amount of credits for one year that you can use in order to learn more about the system, okay? So now this is the overall console. What you can do is you can also invoke something called the cloud shell. Right, and the cloud shell is, so the cloud shell in the case of Google Cloud is that it is essentially once again, you know, providing you access to a Linux machine, right? Uh, similar to what Replit or Glitch had. But in this case, it also has a lot of the infrastructure or, you know, other commands that have been custom installed over there that allow you to sort of get started using the Google Compute Engine, Google App Engine and various things related to that. So you'll see, for example, that, you know, when you log in, it gives you some extra information like to set your cloud platform project in this session, use G Cloud config set and so on, okay? Now, what is all that? I mean, you know, it also has a slightly different interface. It's a little less sort of, you know, flashy than uh, what Replit or Glitch uh, look like. And it doesn't sort of present you with a nice browser interface, a nice uh, file manager. All of those are there, but the main focus is clearly on, you know, getting things done. So this is meant more for sort of professional work, right? Or at least that's the impression they want to give. And the fact of the matter is that, yes, it is because the kind of scaling that it does and the kind of applications that Google App Engine is typically used for are not really toy applications, right? Or some small thing that you and a couple of friends might be developing. Usually you would want to go this when you are ready to sort of start scaling up, okay? Which means that you should probably have a slightly better understanding of how to use these things, okay? So you practice on small applications, but then start building up, okay? You will definitely need to know more about the shell and how to use that when you want to scale to large applications. Once again, just like the others, you know, this is a Linux machine, which means that I can type in the same LS CPU and the uh, free commands. And I find that, in fact, you know, once again over here, I have uh, four CPUs, right? And in this case, it basically has like 16 GB of RAM that it provides to me, right? So, like I said, that by itself does not really say anything. It's not that the 16 GB or the 26 GB or the 6 GB is going to make a difference to your application. 
this is just for the temporary development environment that they are providing you once you have things working you are expected to basically take that and figure out what kind of a overall system you want to deploy it on now in this case what i did was i essentially had cloned one of the examples that they provide as part of the google cloud right and you know in fact what you can do is you can pretty much just go to uh, one of the folders and those of you who are familiar with this might realize that you know this is essentially showing you the editor that they are using is pretty much like visual studio code right it's using the same interface right and the reason is visual studio code itself is an application in javascript and therefore can be run as part of a web based system as well right uh, I believe this is based on VS code or at least something very similar to that which is being used okay so what we can do is you know you can go in there and basically open uh, any file that you want in this case I had already installed or downloaded some of the application uh, examples right from app engine and what we have is there is a standard uh, one for flask right which yeah if we go down here we find that there is a flask application that basically says hello world okay and if i open that folder what i will find is that you know it has once again it gives me the same you know uh, uh, kind of interface um, that i can use in order to edit files and in my main.py the main python file it basically shows me what it's going to run over there right and that is once again you know just start the flask and in app.route slash all that it does is basically return hello world okay now if i go back to my uh, console right i will find that there is actually a particular url that i can go and visit that it shows me saying this is where it is actually going to be deployed and the link that i have shown right at the top is the particular instance that i had created right something dot dot com flask test was the name that i gave it adds on some numbers over there to make it unique right and then it basically allows me to create it something dot dot com and hello world right which is after all the output of the slash root that was created out there so let's summarize what we looked at in terms of the examples right first we saw replit which you have all used as part of your course the main focus over there is more on learning how to code and you know uh, maybe even collaborative development right definitely collaborative teaching it's helpful from that point of view but it's also useful for collaborative development uh, they pro provide a setup whereby you can run your app right and typically the condition is that after a certain amount of time the app will automatically shut down right if there are no requests so there the app will shut down and then if you access it again then it restarts it but it might take a certain amount of time and they have some restrictions on how much load you are allowed to put on it and so on glitch is the next option that we looked at very similar in some ways to what replit can do does not really have the education aspects sort of built in from the beginning but they do have some kind of uh, specialized features that try to sort of uh, you know make it easier for people who are actually developing an app and going through the initial stages of deployment so that you can actually get it tested and multiple people can even work on developing and working on the app right and google app engine was one example i showed where you know it's on a different scale right the complexity of the interface itself is significantly it's harder to use but the reason for that is because it's meant for harder use cases right it's meant for the usage in a scenario where you have a lot more scaling and other issues to be concerned about and it's not just a very small example that you're trying to work with okay so the degree of complexity ease of use can make a big difference right i'm not saying that replit or glitch cannot be used to develop a complex app they can and i'm not saying that google app engine cannot be used to develop a simple app both of those cases are possible it's just which one the main focus is on okay and apart from that of course you know so the PAS, in other words, is providing a complete platform, not just a machine, but also installing the operating system, installing a web server, taking care of HTTPS, taking care of, you know, making sure that the file system has enough space, there is enough memory, what happens if a server crashes, 
Do you get warnings when you are sort of, you know, exceeding certain limits in terms of usage and so on? All of that is taken care of as part of the platform. That's the service that they provide. Okay. And there are multiple different service providers. I showed you only Google App Engine, but AWS, Amazon has Elastic Beanstalk. There is something else called Heroku. All of those have very similar kinds of behavior, right? I mean, they provide platforms which would typically be the more popular ones. Python plus Flask is one of them, Python Django, PHP Laravel, right? Node.js and React or Node.js and various other kinds of platforms, right? All of those are common things that you are likely to find in the PaaS providers. Now, of course, one of the things that needs to be done is you don't want to just be developing code on a browser and you know in, uh, deploying it uh, on a system somewhere. You need to be able to have a num integration with a number of other best practices that are used in code development. Okay, this includes version control, what's called CI/CD, continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous deployment, and various degrees of scaling and automation. So all of these aspects are also very important from the point of view of the final deployment of an app. And that's a thing that we'll look at in the next video.